good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, the ACI Ontario Chapter webinar series. Uh, today, we have Mary Jane Ferraro, a professional engineer with 16 years of experience in the design and construction of large scale tunnel projects with values ranging from a hundred million to a billion dollars. Working for clients including Metrolinx, Halton Region, and the OPG. Her roles have included office engineer and design manager on several tunnel construction projects, including the Scarborough subway extension, the Mid Halton effluent outfall, and the Niagara tunnel project. And today she is going to be presenting on the tunneling under the 401. So Mary Jane, welcome and the presentation is all yours. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, so today I'm gonna talk to you about the construction of the Highway 401 rail tunnel in the city of Toronto. Um, I worked on this project for over two and a half years as the contractor's design manager. And uh, the project was just recently completed in July of 2021. Um, so let's get started. I'm just going to close my camera here. So the project is located within the city of Toronto, um, right at the interchange between Highway 401 and Highway 409. So we've got Islington Avenue um, to the east of the tunnel and, and Kipling to the west. Uh, the tunnel is immediately uh, adjacent to uh, the rail corridor, um, the, the, Kitchener, uh, the Kitchener Rail Corridor, which is highlighted um, with this yellow line here. So just to give you a brief overview of the project, um, the tunnels were constructed on behalf of Metrolinx. Um, Metrolinx um, constructed uh, this tunnel as part of the expansion of the Kitchener Rail Corridor. Uh, the project was delivered under the design build finance model so that means that the contractor resp was responsible for the design construction and financing of the project the contractor was toronto tunnel partners uh, and that was a joint venture between strabag and elliston the designer of the tunnel was dr sauer partners and the designer for the structures and civil works surrounding the tunnel was wsp um, there were several temporary uh, structures that were required for, for the purposes of construction, and those were designed by R.V. Anderson. So the two twin rail tunnels, um, which are kind of represented by these dashed red lines here, are each 180 meters long, and they cross beneath 21 lanes of, of Highway 401. Um, the tunnels are two and a half meters um, below the surface of the highway. So that's the, uh, the minimum distance between the crown of the tunnels and the, and the surface of the pavement was, was just two and a half meters. Um, given this very low cover above the tunnels, the, the risk profile on this project was, was very high. And for this reason, the project team decided to install a pre-support pipe canopy um, above both of the tunnels prior to excavation. The, um, the tunnel was excavated by SEM, uh, which stands for Sequential Excavation Method. The excavated cross-section of the tunnels uh, were 10 and a half meters high by nine meters wide. So these are two very large, tum two very large tunnels. Uh, there were two cross passages uh, that were constructed between the tunnels uh, for smoke dispersion and um, emergency egress. And the final lining of the tunnels included a full round waterproofing membrane and a 300 millimeter thick cast in place concrete. So I'm just gonna run through a brief agenda for the presentation today. I'm gonna to start off with a bit of an introduction and background to the project. Um, I'm gonna talk about a, a median shaft that was constructed in the middle of the highway in order to uh, support the pipe canopy installation. I'm going to talk about the design and the equipment used for the um, for the installation of the pipe canopies. I'm going to talk about our experience um, installing these pipes under the highway, uh, and then I'm going to give a little bit of a, an overview over the progress of the tunnel excavation below the pipe canopies, and finally I will talk a little bit about the construction of the final lining. 
So the twin rail tunnels uh, are located immediately adjacent to an existing rigid frame uh, structure that was constructed in 1965 um, as part of the expansion of Highway 401 to the configuration um, that it's in today. Um, these, the new tunnels are very close to this existing tunnel. I think at one point they're just uh, two meters apart. And because of that close proximity, the, the new tunnel actually intersects a number of wing walls um, that are attached to the existing tunnel. So as part of our work, we ha actually had to uh, partially remove those wing walls during excavation of the tunnel. Uh, the other notable structure um, in close proximity to the new tunnels is this retaining wall that runs along the, the ramp, the, the Highway 409 ramp. Uh, this existing retaining wall is supported on vertical and battered piles, which you can see um, directly intersect um, the alignments of the tunnels. Um, and also we had to uh, install a shaft in the highway median. So you can see the, the sheet pile shaft in the photo here. Um, the shaft was necessary in order to get access um, for the installation of these pipes. Uh, project geology is quite simple. Um, tunnel one is situated entirely in this pink formation here, which is a, uh, a stiff uh, clay fill. Tunnel two, um, the crown of tunnel two is situated in a fine sand. This fine sand was the backfill material that was used to backfill this rigid stream, the rigid frame structure uh, when it was constructed. And then both tunnels are underlain by a a, glance, uh, sorry, a dense glacial till. Uh, as part of our contract, we had to perform uh, continuous monitoring of the highway surface and subsurface for the entire duration of the project. Uh, so in order to accomplish this, um, we developed an automated monitoring system uh, consisting of automated total stations that monitored the highway surface. You can see um, a picture of the total station um, on the right hand side here mounted on a tower. So we had four of those towers um, and they were constantly measuring over 400 points on the highway surface. Um, at the subsurface we used shape arrays. So the shape arrays are represented um, by the blue lines here on the lower part of the screen. Um, and these shape arrays were installed inside conduits which were um, drilled under the highway using horizontal directional drilling. So the shape arrays were actually able to, to measure the deformation of the subsurface below the highway pavement and, and provide a, produce a profile of that deformed um, surface. So I'll just give you a bit of a, an overview over the construction sequence. So we started with excavation of the east and west portals. Uh, so you can see in this photo here, uh, we excavated the portals down to a working level that was required for the installation of the pipe canopies. Um, the highway embankments were supported with soil nail walls. Uh, after that was completed, we started construction of the, the median shaft. Uh, and then we started installing the pipe canopies from the portals. So we started with the, the east side, installing pipes there, and then we moved into the shaft, we installed the pipes from the shaft, and then finally uh, we went over to the west side and start, started installing pipes from the west side. Um, at the same time that the pipe canopies were being installed, tunnel excavation began. So we started with the top heading of uh, tunnel one. Once that was completed, we excavated the invert of tunnel one, and then uh, we started with top heading of tunnel two and then invert of tunnel two. Uh, once tunnel excavation was complete, we started with the final lining works. So we first had to install a waterproofing membrane in the invert of the tunnel. And then, um, and then we placed concrete in the invert. And once that was completed, um, we placed the waterproofing membrane in the arch um, section of the lining, followed by the cast in place concrete in the arch. And then once the lining was complete, um, we performed contact grouting in order to fill any remaining voids between the concrete and the waterproofing membrane. So I'm just gonna give you a, a, a brief overview over the, uh, the construction of the median shaft. So 
Um, we installed this median shaft, as I mentioned, in order to get access for pipe installation. Um, you can see the yellow highlighted area here that re represents the, um, the existing rail tunnel. So this median shaft was, uh, was immediately adjacent to this existing tunnel and actually butted right up against um, the wall of the tunnel. Um, on, the, on the east side of the shaft, um, over here, we have the, um, this retaining wall that I mentioned supporting Highway 409. So the sheet pile was installed flush with this retaining wall. And then on the west side of the shaft, the, um, uh, the sheet pile was installed just half a meter um, from the highway barrier. So this was a, this was a highly constrained site. Um, access was uh, from the south side only, and that was provided um, from the eastbound collector lanes. Um, and then we, we also installed a gantry crane, which was supported on the shaft walls. And the gantry crane was, uh, was able to pick up uh, material from, from the loading area here and, and drop it down into the shaft. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention was the, uh, this, the, the angle between the shaft itself and the alignment of the tunnel was at a skew. So that kind of created some, uh, some interesting uh, design challenges. So the, uh, the design of the shaft, um, as I mentioned, was, was at a skew um, to the alignment of the tunnel. So the tunnel um, passed, through, passed through the shaft at an angle. Um, the shaft had to be designed to support the existing structures that it was adjacent to. So this, um, this wing wall um, that was attached to the existing tunnel um, was exposed during excavation, as was the, the wall of the tunnel. So once excavation exposed these walls, the shaft had to then um, provide support to those walls. Um, the shaft also had to be designed for unbalanced loading. Um, because it was fully loaded um, by the soil only on three sides, but then the fourth side um, uh, was exposed. So there was uh, unbalanced loading on the structure. Um, the shaft had to be designed for uh, the installation of the pipe canopies. So we had to ensure that uh, the struts and whalers did not obstruct the area where the pipes needed to be installed. And, and of course, the shaft also had to respect uh, the very strict settlement limits um, that had to be met. So this is a finite element model of the shaft. So this pink area here represents the, the location of maximum stress in the sheet pile. And of course, that was exactly the location where we had to cut through the sheet pile in order to install these pipes. So that problem was solved um, by using a, sheary, a series of shear plates. So once the, the hole in the sheet pile wall was cut and the pipe was installed, um, we then welded um, a number of plates um, between the pipe and the, and the sheet pile to then reconnect uh, the pipe with the wall and try to reinstate that stiffness that was lost um, by cutting the hole. So now I'm going to get into uh, some detail on the, um, the pre-support pipe canopies. So these pipes um, were included in the design of the tunnel essentially as a, a risk mitigation strategy. Um, as I mentioned, the cover to the highway surface was very low, and uh, these pipes kind of provided um, a roof over, over the tunnel as it was being excavated. So they were kind of designed as longitudinal structural elements, which could, could bridge this, uh, the gap um, that was being excavated below. There were 13 pipes um, installed above each of the tunnels in an arch configuration. Um, the diameter of the pipes was 800 millimeters and the pipes were 12 millimeters thick. Um, the original design of the pipe canopy um, required only 500 millimeter diameter pipes, but we, we recognized the fact that um, these highway, highway fills contained um, a number of you know, potential obstructions. And in order to be able to clear obstructions from inside the pipe, the pipe had, diameter had to be larger. And that's why we went with this 800 millimeter uh, diameter. So the, canopy, the canopies were installed in four reaches. Um, 
the pipes installed from the east were 32 meters long, so from the eastward towards um, towards the Highway 409 uh, retaining wall. Of course, the pipes could not pass through the, the, the vertical and battered piles, so they stopped um, as soon as they reached the piles. And then from the shaft, pipes were installed um, westward back towards the retaining wall again. And then from the west side of the shaft, pipes were installed westward um, those were 40 meters long. And then from the west portal, um, pipes were installed eastward um, back towards the shaft. Um, the equipment used to install these pipes uh, were, were auger boring machines. So the, uh, the project purchased three of these machines. Uh, the machines were designed and manufactured by Bortec. Um, these machines have a, a thrust capacity of 315 tons and a maximum torque of 50,000 kilonewtons. Uh, the machines are equipped with a modular frame and the frame um, was adjustable between uh, eight meters in length and 16 meters in length. And that was important on this project because um, when we were installing pipes from inside the shaft, we had to use a much shorter pipe length so um, in order to, to install the four meter long pipes, uh, the machine had to be um, configured to the eight meter length. And then from the portals, we installed 12 meter long pipes. Um, and then we used the full length of the machine at 16 meters. The machine was also equipped with uh, hydraulic jacks, uh, which provided uh, 200 millimeters of vertical adjustment. And these machines were capable of both unguided and guided auger boring. So unguided auger boring is exactly what it sounds like. Um, the cutter head and augers are loaded into the pipe. The pipe is placed in the machine. Everything is lined up um, to match the, uh, the center line of the pipe. And then once the operator starts advancing the pipe into the ground, he no longer has any control over the direction of the pipe. Uh, with guided auger boring, it works a little bit differently. So the... Um, the operator first installs a pilot rod into the ground. So the machine pushes the pilot rod into the ground. It's guided by a, a theodolite, which measured, measures target on the back of the pilot head. And the operator um, kind of watches that target and he can actually steer the pilot rod by rotating it. And this, uh, the tapered end on, on the end of the pilot rod um, allows the operator to control the direction of the pilot. So once the pilot is advanced to the end of the pipe drive, uh, the pipes and augers are then um, loaded into the machine. And as they're pushed into the ground, the hollow, the hollow stem of the auger swallows the pilot rod. And that's what maintains uh, the pipe on that alignment. So of course, these machines uh, generate a significant amount of, of thrust reaction. So they need something to push against. Um, so when we were auger boring the shaft, uh, that was quite simple because the machines were able to push against the shaft walls. But installing pipes from the tunnel portals was a little more difficult because we were working in an, essentially an open field and there was nothing for the machines to push against. Um, and also because of the arch configuration of the tunnel, each pipe had to be, um, the machine had to be installed at a unique position and height. Um, as it progressed through the installation of the of all the pipes in the canopy, um, and that was that was quite straightforward when the when the machine was was lowered down. So the lower pipes were about 1.4 meters off the ground. Um, so it's relatively simple to transfer that reaction down to the down to the concrete slab. But once the machine uh, got up to the arch of the tunnel, it actually had to be raised 4.2 meters in the air, and transferring that thrust force back down to the ground um, became a much um, more complicated problem. So the way we dealt with that was um, through the design of a, of a reaction frame. So this was a modular frame that could be configured in different ways. So this first um, image here shows the, the position of the machine installing pipes at the lower end of the pipe canopy. Um, so the machines would push against this frame and the frame was ballasted um, with a number of large concrete blocks. So that's the location of the thrust reaction there. The machine pushes on the frame. Um, the frame wants to overturn. 
but then the mass at the back of the frame provides that uh, resistance to the overturning moment. And um, we also installed uh, shear pins in the concrete, um, which were designed to resist sliding of the frame. So for the pipes uh, that needed to be installed at the higher elevation, um, we, we would bolt on an extension to this, to this backstop section of the frame. And this extension basically provided a platform where we could place uh, concrete blocks um, within the frame that the machine could then be placed on top of. So it's the same principle here. Um, the machine pushes on the frame. So at the maximum, we were, we were pushing 4.2 meters above the ground. So this was, this was a very large structure. This frame was four and a half meters tall and um, 20 meters long. So when the machine pushes on the frame, the frame, again, the frame wants to overturn, um, but the mass um, provided by the, the concrete blocks that were used to lift the machine um, provided that counterbalancing moment um, in order to re resist um, overturning and keep the whole thing stable. And again, we had a shear pin um, installed at the back there to prevent sliding. So this is a photo of the reaction frame. <coughs> Um, the frame could be disassembled into three different pieces. Um, at the lower right-hand side here, you can see a photo of the concrete blocks um, that we cast on site um, in order to, to place in the frame to, to raise the machine to the required elevation. And we also produced a bunch of smaller sized um, shim blocks, if you will, um, to, to ensure that we could um, reach all the different heights that were required. Uh, and then at the back of the frame here, you can see uh, these four shear pins um, that were installed into the concrete slab um, to resist sliding. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about our um, experience um, installing these pipes under the highway. So we started at the east portal. At the east portal, um, we had one auger boring machine installing 25 pipes. Uh, the pipes were each uh, 32 meters long, and the segment, uh, the pipe segments were each 12 meters long. So in order to uh, complete the drive, we had to install um, three pipes um, at the East Portal. Uh, the pipes here were installed using unguided auger boring. Um, because of the relatively short length, the 32 meter length, um, for schedule reasons, we, we elected to go with, uh, with the unguided um, method here. And as I mentioned before, each pipe, of course, had to be installed um, with this um, entire setup um, at, at a unique position and height for each drive. So that meant that after each pipe was installed, this whole setup here had to be, had to be teared down um, the machine had to be relocated and then, and then everything reassembled again. So you can see that in the photos on the bottom here, you can see the machine sitting on the ground. Um, the concrete blocks would then be removed from the frame. The crane would pick up the frame, relocate it, and then um, place the, the, frame, the blocks back in the frame and then lift the machine and place it back on top of the blocks. Um, this setup and tear down process um, took quite a while at first, but once the crews got used to got used to the um, to the sequence of the work, they were able to uh, to complete the teardown and the setup in a single shift. Um, so progress um, auger boring progress at the east portal went relatively well. Uh, the ground conditions were were good. Um, we didn't encounter uh, very many obstructions in the ground, and uh, that meant that jacking forces. Um, stayed within a re reasonable range. So jacking forces were between 60 and 160 tons um, for the installation of these pipes. And the pipes took approximately uh, two months to complete um, from, from the East Portal. So on the West side, um, it was similar. We, we used a similar setup uh, to what was used on the East. We had one auger boring machine installing uh, 24 different pipe drives. Um, at this end, the total length of the pipes was 78 meters. And for that reason, uh, we decided to use the, the guided auger boring method. 
because the pipe length was just too long um, to rely on the unguided method. So as I described earlier, um, that meant that we first had to install a pilot rod um, into the ground. You could see uh, a photo of the pilot rod here on, on the lower left-hand side of the screen. So that pilot rod um, had that tapered head and it could be installed in the ground um, right on the uh, design alignment of the pipe. So working in the shaft um, was, was very different from working from the portals. So here we had two auger boring machines working simultaneously inside the shaft. Um, and we had to install a total of 52 pipe drives from inside the shaft. So the two machines um, installed the pipes on the east side, and then we were able to turn them around and then push pipes in the other direction um, on the west side. So because of the, um, the limited width available in the shaft, we had to use four meter long um, pipe segments um, and the machines were configured um, to an eight meter length in order to install those pipes. Um, so because we, had to, we were installing four meter long pipes, that meant there was a lot more uh, welding of the joints required um, for each pipe. Um, again, inside the shaft, we used concrete blocks to raise the machines up to the required elevations. Um, and because of the skew angle between the tunnel and the shaft, the machines could not push directly against the, uh, the sheet pile wall. So we uh, designed and fabricated um, these little wedge frames here, which were bolted to the back of the machine. And, um, and those were then used to transfer the, the thrust reaction from the machine to the sheet pile wall. Um, all of the work um, carried out in the shaft um, was accomplished using a gantry crane that was installed um, on the shaft walls. So the gantry crane was used to, um, to remove the muck bins from, from below the machines. Uh, the crane was used to lower the pipes down into the machines and the crane was also used uh, to lift up the machines and relocate them for each pipe drive. And because of the skew angle, um, you can see in the, the middle photo here, these struts were crossing, um, crossing the machines at an angle. So these struts were constantly um, directly above the machines, which, which meant that maneuvering these machines inside the shaft was, was extremely difficult. Um, another interesting uh, note was, um, so prior to cutting the hole um, in the sheet pile, in, in order to advance the pipe, uh, we were concerned that the soil could ravel into the shaft and, and cause settlement above. So we actually pre-grouted all of the locations where, where the pipes would be installed. So we used an acrylic grout um, basically to consolidate those soils um, prior to, to cutting the sheet pile and, and removing, that, removing that steel plate. Uh, another challenge associated with working inside the shaft was the fact that this one wall was, was installed um, partially overlapping with the existing wing wall um, supporting the Highway 409 retaining wall. Um, and we had to core through this wing wall in order to install these pipes. So again, we were dealing with this skew angle, so the, the holes had to be cored, um, cored on the skew and this wall was quite thick. Um, and so drilling through it at an angle meant that um, we had to get through a maximum concrete thickness of 1.2 meters. So there were seven, seven of these holes had to be cored through uh, this wing wall before the pipes could be installed. Uh, the shaft drives um, were also challenging because uh, numerous obstructions were encountered in the ground. So these obstructions were all um, were left in the ground uh, when the highway was filled um, back in the mid 60s. Uh, we ran into things like concrete blocks, boulders, um, wood debris, steel debris, all kinds of different things. Um, these obstructions uh, made advancing the pipes um, very difficult at times. Um, it meant that jacking forces uh, were increased considerably. So we were, um, we were getting up to jacking forces in the neighborhood of 200 tons um, for a lot of these drives. And uh, there were many instances where the pipe 
uh, or the, the pipe in the machine could not actually clear the obstruction that was in there. So we would then have to remove the cutter head, remove the augers from the pipe. Workers would then enter the pipe and manually clear the obstruction. So sometimes that involved jackhammers um, to chip you know, concrete debris. And then once they were able to clear that obstruction, then um, auger boring could resume. Uh, and there were a few instances as well where, where these obstructions damaged the cutter head. So um, the cutter heads would have to be fixed um, before um, the work could continue. Uh, on the west portal side, we, we also encountered an obstruction, but of a very different nature uh, from what we saw on the shaft. Um, at approximately meter 55 um, from the start of the drive, the pipes hit um, a buried shoring wall that was left in the highway. Um, and because um, these, the, uh, the interior of these pipes was a confined space, uh, no flame cutting uh, was permitted. So the workers had to actually enter the pipe and, and they were able to remove um, a, lot of this, uh, a lot of these steel elements using a reciprocating saw. And I remember um, talking to the guys at the time when, when this work was going on and they said they had gone through, I think 4,000 um, saw blades removing all of these steel elements. So they did the best that they could. Um, many of the pipes could be advanced um, to the end of the drive, um, but in the end, only 50% um, made it all the way to the end. So that left some, some gaps um, in the pipe canopy. Uh, it took a very long time to, co to complete the pipe drives from the west side. Um, where there were no obstructions present, the pipes could be uh, installed in, in a couple of days, but in, in the, uh, for the drives, uh, where this sheet pile wall was encountered. Um, some pipes took up to a week to complete um, and in some cases even more. So overall, um, the drives from the west side took six months to complete, um, which was a lot longer than the two months um, that were re required on the east side. So one of the challenges that we had um, was maintaining, um, maintaining the proper pipe alignment so as I mentioned from the east side, uh, conditions were quite favorable. And as a result, the pipe alignment was actually quite good. So 80% of the pipes um, maintained a deviation of less than 1%. But from the, uh, the drives that were installed from the shaft and the west where obstructions were encountered, um, were plagued with misalignment. Uh, and this misalignment ranged uh, typically between three and 500 millimeters. Um, in some, some cases, it was a bit more. So you can see these two cross sections on the top here. These are taken from the, uh, the shaft east drive. So you can see this um, chainage 62 here. That's the start of the drive. All the pipes are lined up nicely. And then by chainage 44 at the end of the drive, you can see that some pipes are missing and other pipes are misaligned. Another issue that we uh, dealt with during installation of the pipes was settlement uh, of the highway surface. Um, settlement varied over the length uh, of the project um, between four and 70 millimeters. So the highest settlements uh, occurred in these red areas here um, in, in close proximity to the shaft walls. And then also at chainage 130, which is this other um, red area here, where this buried structure was encountered. Um, so a lot of these areas that contained obstructions, um, we, we noted that the, the material there was, was a lot less consolidated than, than other areas of the tunnel. And in, in the areas where we had um, this poor consolidation, um, we believe that that was what led to this increase in settlement. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about our experience tunneling under these pipe canopies. So these tunnels uh, were excavated by SEM. Um, again, that stands for sequential excavation method. So we used a, a compact excavator to, to dig these tunnels um, one, one meter at a time. So the, the soil was removed and then the initial lining would be installed um, kind of round by round. So the initial lining consisted of 
uh, a lattice girder. Um, lattice girders were spaced at one meter, uh, two layers of wire mesh, and 300 millimeters of shotcrete. Um, so on the right hand side, uh, sorry, on the left hand side here, you can see the excavation of the top heading of the tunnel, and on the left hand side, you can see the excavation of the uh, the invert of the tunnel. And of course, um, we had a number of contingency measures um, planned for this tunnel excavation. We called them our toolbox measures, and uh, those were to be used uh, in the event that difficult uh, ground conditions were encountered. Uh, so excavation of Tunnel 1 proceeded quite well. Tunnel 1, um, if you remember, it was within this clay fill material and the clay was actually quite stiff. You can see, you can see the marks from the, from the excavator teeth in the clay. Um, it was a stiff material and it was uh, very favorable um, for tunneling. Um, you can see on the left hand side here, um, the pipes are all um, well aligned and um, that made for um, also easy excavation of the tunnel. On the left-hand side here, um, there were gaps in the, um, in the pipe canopies. So this is the area where we encountered this, uh, this existing retaining wall supporting the Highway 409 with the vert vertical and battered piles. So the pipes could, um, could not pass through this area. So from the east, um, they stopped at the battered piles, and from the west, they had to stop at the vertical piles, um, and this left a gap. So you can see in the photo on the right-hand side here, um, there's only two pipes um, within this particular uh, cross-section of the tunnel. And here we had to install, we had to use some of our toolbox measures in order to overcome this area. So you can see um, in the roof here, there's some rebar spiles that were installed into the ground um, prior to excavation. And you can see one of the exposed piles here um, at the face. Uh, so you can also see that the pipes are, are misaligned and these misaligned pipes had to actually be cut out and then integrated into the shotcrete lining. And similarly, the, the piles that were encountered were cut um, flush with the, the profile of the tunnel. Uh, a steel plate was welded on the bottom and then that was also integrated into the uh, shellcrete lining. Uh, tunnel two, tunnel two, um, for tunnel two, the excavation was a lot more challenging. Uh, the crown of tunnel two was entirely within a very fine sand. Uh, this, this is the sand that was used to backfill um, the existing tunnel that was adjacent. Um, so this made, made tunneling conditions a lot more difficult. Um, in Tunnel 2, we were also dealing with um, missing and misaligned pipes. Uh, we also had to pass through this uh, zone with the vertical and battered piles. Uh, we were removing um, the wing walls um, attached to the existing tunnel. So in this photo here, you can see uh, the excavator um, within the top heading of the tunnel on the left-hand side. And then on the right hand side, you can see one of these wing walls um, protruding into the tunnel. So the excavator had to actually excavate around this wall. And then we used a diamond wire saw um, to cut this, um, to cut the wall flush with the profile of the tunnel. Um, in the area where we encountered this buried structure, we actually had to remove um, the components of that structure during tunneling. And as I mentioned previously, the ground in this area was quite um, unconsolidated in some places, and that caused some face stability problems. So again, we had to uh, reach into our toolbox in order to deal with these conditions. Uh, we used rebar spiles, which you can see um, in both of these photos. Um, we did some pre-excavation grouting with acrylic, uh, and we also used pocket excavation, uh, which meant that we were um, excavating a smaller area of the face um, prior to installing the ground support. So that also helped to maintain uh, stability of the opening. There were a couple of instances where we had to perform emergency closure of the highway lanes. Uh, so in one instance, a small sinkhole developed on the surface of the highway. The sinkhole was approximately one cubic meter and it wasn't picked up by any of the, of the monitoring instruments. 
it was actually picked up during a routine um, inspection by the area maintenance contractor. The, the maintenance contractor saw a small hole in the asphalt. And when he went to have a look, um, he realized there was a void underneath. So he immediately contacted us and we went out there, backfilled the void and repaved the highway. And we had the lanes back open um, by the next morning. Um, there was another instance where um, tunneling in the sand, during, while we were tunneling this uh, sand formation, there was a loss of several cubic meters of sand from above the tunnel. Uh, so again, we quickly moved to uh, close the two lanes that were above that area. And then the workers were able to, to get that sealed off and backfilled uh, within a few hours, um, allowing the highway to reopen. So just despite some of these small hiccups that we had, we were able to complete the excavation of these tunnels without any major impact to the highway. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the construction of the final concrete lining for these tunnels. Um, the final lining includes a full round waterproofing membrane. Uh, the product that we use was Sikaplan, which is a, a PVC membrane. Uh, the membrane um, has joints which are, are fully welded and we installed water stops along all the construction joints. So you can see the water stops in the in the middle photo here. Um, there was a longitudinal water stop that ran along the joint between the invert and the arch concrete and then uh, circumferential water stops uh, located at each of the construction joints between the different concrete sections. Um, we installed uh, grout hoses um, in the invert for contact grouting, and also grout hoses were installed in all of the all of the water stops um, as a contingency for um, for future in, in the event that um, a leak were to develop in this uh, tunnel at some point in the future, um, someone could go back and use these hoses to grout these water stops. Uh, the mix design that was used for the final lining was developed um, by the project team on site. So this was a custom design mix. Uh, the mix was validated by pre-construction testing uh, in order to confirm that it met all of the requirements of the design. Uh, the specified strength of the mix was 40 MPA at 28 days. Um, we used a, a blended cement that included 8% silica fume. Uh, the mix included uh, micro synthetic fiber, um, which was designed to prevent explosive spalling of the concrete um, in the event of a fire. And it also included a macro synthetic fiber, um, which was dosed at um, between five and six kilograms per cubic meter um, to provide some structural reinforcement. So primarily this was an unreinforced lining. Um, it, was, it was just this macro synthetic fiber that provided um, provided some tensile resistance, um, but the tunnel portals um, were, were fully reinforced. So these two photos here show the construction of the portals. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the, uh, this was the concrete pour from the, the first portal on tunnel one on the east side. And then on the right-hand side here, um, this is looking at the west portal of the tunnel. So you can see the, the completed portal um, at tunnel one and the rebar being placed in the portal at tunnel two. So the concrete was cast in two stages. So we first poured the, the invert concrete um, and then that was followed by the arch. So the invert was essentially, um, was essentially a flat surface, but we did have to form the, the joints between the invert and the arch because that joint had to be radial. So in order to do that, we designed and fabricated these, these triangular steel brackets that you can see in the photo. Those were bolted to the wall of the tunnel and those brackets uh, supported this steel plate, which was used to form that joint. Uh, they also served as a, as a walkway to get around the concrete pour. And they were also a, a convenient place to support the, um, the, the rail um, that was used to support the, uh, the screed that was used to finish the surface of the concrete. Um, so we used an, an Allen screed um, to finish the surface, and the Allen screed was was uh, was adjustable, and that allowed us to form the uh, the cross falls that were required uh, to promote promote drainage um, towards a trough that ran the length of the tunnel. So 
So for the uh, the arch section of the concrete, we used a steel form, which you can see on the left hand side here. This photo was taken uh, during the assembly of the formwork. Um, the form was 10 meters long. Um, this form had been previously used on a tunnel project in Europe, and it was refurbished and modified uh, to suit the geometry um, for this project. So that was uh, delivered to the site and assembled on site. Uh, the form was fully uh, hydraulic and it was also self-propelled. So um, the form uh, traveled on wheels operated by um, electric motors uh, and those wheels traveled on rails that were installed on the, in the tunnel invert. So you can see over on the right hand side here, you can see the rails um, and the wheels sitting on the rails. Um, concrete consolidation was accomplished using um, external vibrators that were mounted on the form. Um, there were a number of, of external vibrators um, that were used um, to, to vibrate the form. And the form also had a, a number of windows that you could open um, to, to perform additional um, internal vibration and, and inspection of, of the concrete as it was um, being placed into the form. So most of the concrete that was placed on this project was, um, was batched on site uh, using a mobile batching plant that was supplied by Sargent. Um, this meant that concrete was always readily available on the site and, and that allowed, uh, really allowed us to maintain the flexibility that we needed to meet the project schedule. Um, while we were casting concrete in tunnel one, we were still excavating in tunnel two um, so we actually had to produce shotcrete and concrete um, at the same time. And the setup of the batch plant allowed us um, to batch, to, to quickly switch back and forth between batching uh, shotcrete and batching concrete. Uh, each of these arch pours was uh, 10 meters long. Uh, typically it took about six hours um, to pour the concrete um, and the stripping strength um, specified in this design was 10 MPA. So the forms um, were typically stripped after around 12 hours. Um, this meant that our work cycle uh, allowed us to place uh, one section of concrete every other day and we were typically pouring uh, three times a week. Uh, there were a total of 38 pours um, between both the tunnels. So the concrete work um, you know, was completed in, in five or six weeks um, for each tunnel. So um, that wraps up my presentation. Um, in conclusion, the, the decision to install these pipe canopies uh, above the tunnel was very successful in mitigating the risk um, of impacting the Highway 401 um, during construction. Um, although some very difficult conditions were encountered during installation of the pipes and during the uh, excavation of the tunnel, um, these conditions were overcome with uh, proper contingency planning and the commitment of a very dedicated and resourceful workforce. Um, the decision to, to batch the concrete on site um, was proved essential in order for us to meet uh, the project schedule. And I'm proud to say that um, this project was actually completed on time um, in July of 2021. So that concludes my presentation. Um, I'd be happy to answer um, questions if there are any. Well, thank you, Mary Jane. Uh, great presentation. Uh, we, there is, you sort of answered uh, one of the questions here is how long did the project take to complete? Um, we did say that it ended in July of 21. Now, when did the project begin? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't mention that. Um, so construction started in early 2019 and was completed in uh, July of 2021. So the construction mm -hmm. portion took two and a half years. Uh, I did forget to mention at the beginning, if you do have any questions, there is a uh, area where you can type your questions in. Um, right now that is the only question that we have uh, today. Uh, if we don't have a chance to uh, get to all of the questions, if you have some for a little later on, 
Um, I will uh, email Mary Jane and we'll try and get you the answers at a, a later time if that uh, is okay with everyone. Uh, once again, thank you, Mary Jane, for an excellent presentation. Um, and uh, we are trying to plan a uh, in-person uh, tour of a precast plant uh, in May. So stay tuned for that. We will be emailing you as soon as we finalize the plans for that. And with that, we thank you for attending and um, we look forward to seeing you at a future event. Thank you very much. Thank you.